this week I have a topic, and it's actually, I'll admit, it's a very serious topic that I want to discuss. Um, one that kind of even very much affects me personally. And it's, in many ways, it's kind of a longer story I'm going to be reading. The story is from uh, The Independent of uh, the United Kingdom. And, I, you know, it's a longer one, so I want to make sure I got plenty of time in uh, to read it. So before I start reading it, what I want to share with you is that if you're a new listener and you're not aware of this, um, I am ethnically Jewish. I do not practice Judaism uh, at all. Okay. Uh, the name sovereign is an, you know, Brian sovereign, the name sovereign is a name I chose actually the lovely and hyperintelligent Dr. Stephanie Murphy came up with it. So, and it is the name I use now. Okay. Uh, but it is a name I chose. I've had, you know, my, my family names, I've got crazy Jewish names, you know, Rothdiener, uh, Kagan, you know, and, and, and others. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it gets nuts when, when you go down like the, the way that, that, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people within Judaism, like, you know, track family lineage and all that. Uh, so I want to express that and something, well, I'll save the rest for later, but I just want you to know, um, you know, that about me, if you didn't already, uh, you know, I don't hold it in any necessarily any high regard per se, uh, but it's there. And so I want to read the story from the independent that came out this week because, um, I think it addresses something very interesting within the Liberty movement, uh, and really, you know, even the world at large, <laughs> but, uh, here we go. The story is the Rothschild libel. Why has it taken 200 years for an anti-Semitic slur that emerged from the battle of Waterloo to be dismissed 30 years after the dust had settled on the fields of Waterloo, a poisonous anti-Semitic pamphlet circulated in Europe claiming the, Wa the Rothschild family had accrued its vast wealth on the back of Wellington's triumph, the quote unquote facts were entirely made up. Now, real quick, I just want to touch on, you know, the Battle of Waterloo is pretty much where Duke Wellington of Britain uh, kind of put an end to the Napoleonic Wars and Emperor Napoleon, uh, his reign. So, uh, you know, essentially, <laughs> that's that's the short and sweet uh, version of that whole thing. And this is, you know, in the 19th century, early 19th century uh, or in the 19th century anyway. So let's read on with the story. In the summer of 1846, a political pamphlet bearing the ominous signature Satan, quote unquote, swept across Europe, telling a story which, though lurid and improbable, left a mark that can be seen to this day. The pamphlet claimed to recount the history of the richest and most famous banking family of the time, the Rothschilds, and its most endearing passage told how their vast fortune was built upon the bloodshed of the Battle of Waterloo, whose bicentenary falls this year, because it was in 1815. Here is the story that, quote unquote, Satan told. Nathan Rothschild, the founder of the London branch of the bank, was a spectator on the battlefield that day in June 1815, and as night fell, he observed the total defeat of the French army. This was what he was waiting for. A relay of fast horses rushed him to the Belgian coast, but here he found to his fury that a storm had confined all ships to port. Undaunted, quote, does greed admit anything is possible, or anything is impossible, end quote, asked Satan. Uh, he paid a king's ransom to a fisherman to ferry him through wind and waves to England. Reaching London 24 hours before official word of Wellington's victory, Rothschild exploded, uh, exploited his knowledge to make a killing on the stock exchange. Quote, in a single coup, uh, announced the pamphlet, he gained 20 million francs, end quote. Beyond all doubt, this tale was anti-Semitic in intent. Satan was in reality a left-wing uh, controversialist called uh, George Darren, or George, yeah, I'll just say George Danville, who made no attempt to hide his loathing for Jews and the Rothschilds in particular. Though they had been little known in 1815, by 1846, the Rothschild had become the Rockefellers or the Gateses of their age, their name a byword for fabulous wealth. Nathan himself had died in 1836 and so could not rebut the claims. Every aspects or every aspect of Darrenville's tale, the ruthlessness, the guile, the greed, represents a derogatory racial stereotype, and he was writing at a moment when such attitudes were having one of their periodic surges of popularity in Europe. 
The story was also false. Nathan Rothschild was not at Waterloo or even in Belgium at the time. There was no channel storm, and he made no great killing on the stock market. Yet the Satan pamphlet, translated into many languages and reprinted many times, gave this legend such a grip on history that, albeit, uh, albeit often in modified or diluted forms, references to it can still be found today both in popular culture and in scholarly works. Versions appear in a Hollywood film of uh, 1934 and the 2009 Sebastian Fox novel, A Week in December, in past editions of the Dictionary of uh, National Biography and Encyclopedia Britannica, and Elizabeth Longford's acclaimed 1970s biography of the Duke of Wellington, and with a very different analysis, in Nail Ferguson's authorized history of the Rothschilds themselves. Perhaps more predictably, the story provided the plot for a Nazi film of, uh, of 1940 entitled The Rothschilds, Shares in Waterloo. And the tale can be read on many anti-Semitic websites. How does a crude racist smear endure for so long? More importantly, how has it survived as a supposed subplot of history towards which even the most respected writers have felt obliged to nod when it is one of those myths that on being challenged with inconvenient facts simply adjusts its form? For example, when it was finally accepted that Nathan Rothschild was definitely not at Waterloo, the story changed. The banker was in London, but had made elaborate preparations to get the news first, either by special messenger or pigeon post. An additional twist was added. Once he knew Wellington had won, Rothschild was said to have deliberately provoked a collapse of the stock market by spreading false rumors of a defeat, so allowing him to pick up shares at rock-bottom prices and double his profits later, after official news of the victory had sent uh, the markets soaring. I just uh, Golden Stallion wants to butt in here. There's also a version that somehow he uh, he promised to, you know, like that essentially he went to, uh, you know, the heads of England and said, you're going to be bankrupt here. I'll make you a loan. Just you give me England. And they said, yes. That's a very popular one in libertarian circles. Reading on. Was there any truth to this revised version or to any of the other variants that have surfaced over the years? We will come to that. The legend has had. Innocent uses, for example, the former CIA chief Alan Dulles repeated it in a 1963 book on espionage as he wanted to illustrate the value of early information. Other writers had adopted the tale simply as a good yarn without any anti-Semitic intent. Even the Rothschild family, always deeply uncomfortable with the story, has tried to domesticate it. Their preferred preferred version glosses over any alleged profits and stresses that Nathan's first actions on hearing of the victory had been that, that of any good citizen of the time. He informed the government... This was the version uh, Elizabeth Langford embraced. All the while, error and trickery were haunting or hampering attempts to separate the myth from the facts. What apparent evidence was there? For many years, historians cited a line from the London Courier newspaper dated uh, June 20th, 1815, two days after the battle and a day before official news of the victory arrived. It stated simply, quote, Rothschild has made great purchases of stock, end quote. On the face of it, this supported the legend, but there is a problem. Those words do not appear in surviving copies of that day's courier. Instead, it now appears that the purported quotation originated in the writings of a Scottish historian, Archibald Allison, in 1848, two years after the Satan uh, pamphlet was published. Further backing for the legend came in the form of an entry in the 1815 diary of a young American visitor to London, James Gallatin. On the day of Waterloo, he writes of great public anxiety over events in Belgium, adding, quote, They say Monsieur Rothschild has m- mounted couriers from Brussels to Ostend and a fast clipper ready to sail the moment something is decisive on the battlefield one way or the other. Once again, this is now what it seems. The Gallatin diary was exposed in 1957 as a fake cooked up in the late 19th century, long after the Satan story had gained currency. The first modern attempt to challenge the myth was made in the 1980s by a Rothschild Baron Victor, a retired scientist and public servant who wrote about his ancestor, Nathan. It was Victor who identified the powerful role played by the Satan pamphlet, and he debunked many of the uh, dafter allegations. But he also discovered in the Rothschild archives a document that muddled the water or that muddied the water. This was a letter written to Nathan Rothschild by a bank employee in Paris about a month after Waterloo, and it included the statement, quote, I am informed by Commissary White, you have done well by the early information which you had of the victory gained at Waterloo, end quote. Proof, it seemed, that the legend had some foundation in fact. Their matters have stood since the 1980s, you know, their matters have stood since the 1980s, and in those years, the old legend has enjoyed a new lease of life online, while historians and writers have continued to pay at lip service. 
But fresh evidence has now surfaced, which allows us finally to put this story in its proper context. Newspapers published in the week of Waterloo make it clear that the first person to bring authentic news of the victory at Waterloo to London was not Nathan Rothschild. Rather, it was a man who had learned of it in the Belgian city of Ghent and made a dash to England. The shadowy figure, identified only as Mr. C. of Dover, was telling his uh, story freely in the city from the morning of Wednesday, 21st of June, at least 12 hours before the official news arrived. It was published in at least three newspapers that afternoon. We also know that a news report written that Wednesday evening referred to Nathan Rothschild receiving a letter from Ghent reporting a victory and passing his news to the government, though this was noted alongside reports of two other similar letters. So while it is confirmed that Rothschild had early news, he was not the only one. Did Rothschild have time to buy shares? Apparently. But in the thin market of the period, it could not have been enough to accumulate holdings sufficient to earn him the millions that Darrenville wrote of. Nor did he manipulate the market to double his gains, for contrary to legend, there was no slump in prices that Wednesday. Nathan Rothschild may have, quote-unquote, done well from his purchases when stocks rose sharply following the confirmation of the victory. But his gains were dwarfed by those of numerous rival investors who, without any advantage of early information, had bought key government securities earlier, more cheaply, and in quantity. 200 years on from Waterloo, then not much is left of Satan's tale. It's just possible to see the factual elements upon which a vivid myth was built. Nathan Rothschild did have, uh, did have early information, and it seems he did buy shares. But it was only by taking these facts out of their relatively humdrum context and adding a heap of falsehoods on top. Relays of horses, storms in the channel, pigeon post, market manipulation. Lizard Jews! I put that one in. That a narrative of any interest was fashioned. There is no doubt why that was done. To smear the Rothschilds and Jews generally. Perhaps this bicentenary year of Waterloo would be a good time to recognize that smear for what it is. So I want to talk about this because from Alex Jones to whoever in, you know, Liberty circles. Yeah. Yeah. Alex Jones is in Liberty, whatever. Okay. All a whole slew of people, you know, some of the ads even that I, that I hear on free talk live or whatever it's all like, oh, those, those New York bankers. I mean, and we all know what that means, right? All of this stuff, all these conspiracy theories, David Ike and anybody that listens to him, you know, all, all, all this different shit that comes out there all based upon the fact that somehow these Jewish families like the Rothschilds have been pulling the strings. And I want to make something clear. You know, The Independent is, uh, uh, you know, a paper that often gets read by. You know, it's re the reporting gets taken as true, as accurate from a lot of people in Liberty Circles. And so when these inconvenient facts come up, I share this on social media. And I thought it would have been really fascinating if a bunch of people maybe came out and said, holy shit, I was wrong. I've done that a lot of times. I've come out and said, I was dead wrong. And I've made some pretty impassioned claims that I was wrong about, and I still admitted it. The evidence stands up pretty well, and there's more than just that article. You can look into it. That this whole theory that somehow the banks have been pulling this and pulling that and doing this and doing that. And they're the grand evil of the planet Earth. Look, centralized banking, you know, all, all that fractional reserve banking, all that it's all bad ideas. Don't, mi don't misunderstand me. I agree. It sucks. Okay. And I don't want it. That's why it's crazy when cryptocurrencies start working with banks. But this narrative that somehow there's the, you know, the, these elites, you know, and it's some like it's this genetic thing that these people might not even be human. That's been weaving its way 
in Liberty Circles is what? It's crazy. The proof doesn't stand up. The empiricism. I got the empiricism right here. I have the empirical evidence. Take a look. The guy didn't fund the wars. In fact, there was other families or not families, but there was other people, other other men, whatever, that that took advantage or, you know, that, that maybe at least tried. In fact, the people that really made bank on it, we have the records to show that they didn't have any clue what was going on. They just made some good guesses. It was like a boxing match. But they said, well, I think Duke Wellington might win this bitch today. I'm betting on Wellington. And that's all it was. It wasn't a grand scheme. You know, now there's a great book by uh, G. Edward Griffin that I recommend anybody read. It, it's really, really well done. It's in like its fifth edition for a good reason. It's The Creature from Jekyll Island. Yes, it's pronounced Jekyll. And in that book, G. Edward Griffin clearly states that, okay, at that point, yes, there was some degree of a plan to, you know, do this and that with the banking system and with the economy and all of that. And I'll buy that one because the evidence stands up. But the interesting thing to point out is ask G. Edward Griffin about those bankers, about, you know, those people that met at Jekyll Island. And he'll tell you they weren't evil people. They were very high minded people. They thought they were doing a very good thing. It's absolutely clear in their own writings, in their own words, that they thought what they were doing was right. People want to talk about Carol Quigley. You know, he's the guy that supposedly was in with this elite group and all this stuff, and he wrote books about it. Okay? Uh, Tragedy and Hope, right? Carol Quigley even says, I wish these people would just, you know, not referring to this supposed elite, you know, I wish they would just come out and say what they're doing because then people would get it. And they'd be like, oh, okay, you guys are, you know, trying to help. What's happening, what's really happening here? in my opinion, is that uh, people, you know, here it is. Life isn't fair. Some people can accept that, others can't. The ones that can't come up with wild fucking theories as to why it isn't. They get out of touch with reality. They create gods. They create lizard people. They create all kinds of, you know, just, just notions that have nothing to back them up. And have no basis in reality. And then they get more people who feel that life's taking a shit on them. And then, you know, that you, you start to feed those egos of these people. And then you start to give them money and you start to do this and this and, you know, and, and, and eventually, you know, you're just, you're, you're living in a different world. You're not in touch with reality and you're putting all blame and, and, and just re-expressing all your traumas externally instead of trying to deal with what's going on on the inside to get to the real answers, why things are the way they are. You find those inside, not outside. I grew up, you know, uh, a pretty well-to-do family. I don't have anything to do with that family anymore. But I grew up with a pretty well-to-do family. I got accused. I got accused of being a lizard person. That's not new to Sovereign Tech listeners. I've talked about that in the show. Uh, I've had to deal with all kinds of shit. I joined the military because of the 9-11 truth movement saying it was Jews that did this. And all of this largely stems back to this story about Nathan Rothschild supposedly making bank off of Napoleon, you know, Napoleon versus Wellington in the Napoleonic Wars. And the story's not true if the basis of your entire theory of history that's been going on isn't true then what's left you got to put that together you need to answer for it i can accept new evidence instead what happens is and this article lays it out very well that people just start changing the story 
willy nilly. They just toss in whatever new. Fa- oh well, actually, ha, ha, okay, fine. Yeah, you're right. He wasn't at Waterloo, but now, no, no, now there was a messenger, and this messenger actually he had this uh, this this uh, blimp made by Leonardo da Vinci himself and flew that to to England. I mean, that's where that's how it goes. And these people just come. There's nothing wrong with speculation either, folks. But you got to make it clear that that's speculation. And you don't go telling people how to live their lives or how to invest or how to do anything with their money or their families or whatever based upon speculation. That's how we get into all this trouble. Is because people don't want to take a good, hard look at reality. And the good, hard look says that most of these conspiracy theories, their foundation isn't real. It's not true, and it's still getting spewed. And what I think people need to do is call these people out when they start talking about it and say, no, that's not right. It's created racism. It's created all kinds of crap over the years. Not just Hitler. How about America? Hitler was just following a lot of uh, a lot of Americans uh, examples in the early part of the 20th century. Go ahead, read up about it. Grab the works of Edwin Black. Take a good look at the evidence. America never stopped being racist after. I mean, it just expanded its racism to all kinds of people, Jews included. And I think a good chunk of the libertarian movement's doing the same goddamn thing because it makes it easy, right? And we don't have to read any more books. You don't have to uh, do any actual research. You don't have to do any soul searching proverbially. You don't have a soul because you can just blame it on someone else. Me? Tired of blaming it on someone else. I have to do something about it. For myself. And the only thing I can really control is myself. I wouldn't want it any other way. So I work on my own traumas, my own things that I had to deal with. And this is in many ways part of that. Coming to these realizations. That what people accused me of. Just because, I mean, of who I was born to. I'm over it. So should everyone else be. <laughs>